Hello and welcome to a brand new Arsblog Arscast right here on Arsblog.com. How are you? Hope you're well. Hope your week has been going okay. Let's face it, our week started badly. Depends what day of the week you like to call the start of the week, whether it's Sunday or Monday, but whatever day it was, it was bad because Monday was the day after the North London Derby, of course, and we we lost that and that's not good. That's never good, but it got a little bit better on Wednesday when we beat Liverpool 2-1, somewhat surprisingly, somewhat slightly, ever so slightly, just a little bit against the run of play. But that's what's great about football. You just never know. So my hope going into Saturday's FA Cup semi-final against Manchester City is that the week which started like down, down, like down, down, down here, down here. That's where the week started. And then it sort of came up again a bit like this when we beat Liverpool. And I'm hoping that, you know, Saturday evening, it's the trajectory is all the way up here, which is me just sort of talking at the roof which might also be construed as the actions of a man who has lost what's left of his tiny little mind. But I think you know where I'm going with this. We do have a very difficult game tomorrow evening against Man City. We're going to talk about that in this particular podcast. A little bit of an extra arse cast. Been a bit of a disaster of a day so far for me from a technical point of view. But hey, we will leave that to one side. We've got things kind of up and running again. It is weird, though, when you're used to doing things in in one way and you have to do do them in a different way it's it's i don't know i don't like change in that regard i don't like things being different because you're used to you know everything being right there and now what's there isn't right there it's sort of there but in a different place but look let's not worry about it let's not worry about it we've beaten liverpool we've beaten the champions thank you this week as well to all the liverpool fans who took seriously the tweets in which i you know kind of tongue-in-cheek okay completely tongue-in-cheek said that we had played them off the park i mean come on i know that there are times where a sarcasm font on the internet could be very very useful but you know this wasn't that subtle i I didn't even speak to the mug smasher about it to be perfectly honest he uh he wasn't watching the game i sent him a text during it and he said no i'm not watching which tells you, of course, that you know he couldn't be arsed one way or the other, whether we won or not, or whether Liverpool won or not. Maybe he was. Maybe he just couldn't watch for a different reason. Maybe he was working. I couldn't say exactly. But it doesn't sound like you know he was that bothered one way or the other. So there's no particular bragging rights from my point of view. I can hardly you know call him up and say, "Ha ha ha! We beat you, and you're much better than we are, and you're champions." And yeah doesn't really work doesn't really work let's make ourselves competitive again and then these games against Liverpool will actually mean something Mikel Arteta has been talking a lot about being competitive about improving the squad there are some comments that he made in his press conference today uh, following the interview that he did on Sky Sports in which many people suggested he was sort of putting it up myself included by the way uh, I felt like these were comments in which he was sort of putting it up to the board putting it up to the executives putting it up to the owners to back him to to make the improvements that we need. And I think that's true to a certain extent, even though he kind of denied it, uh, that they were the main motivation for his comments. But we're going to talk about that, and uh, we'll talk about the Man City game and more. So let's, uh, let's say hello to our guest on this particular episode from Football London. It's James Bench. Hi, James. Hi, Andrew. How are you doing? I am all right, thank you. Um, we were just talking before we started this about Mikel Arteta's press conference, and obviously there were... Myriad topics put to him from Ainsley Maitland-Niles to Danny Ceballos, Mesut Ozil, of course, uh, and the comments that he made uh, at the end of the, the Liverpool game about recruitment, about squad building, about investment improving and those sort of things. But before I get into the, the nuts and bolts of that, th- th- it just struck me that, you know, it's not, it's not a case, you know, as an Arsenal fan, y- you find your club boring or whatever I don't want to put it like that but I have to say I'm finding Arsenal maybe it's the 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 circumstances the context the fact that Mikel Arteta is very when he's asked the right question in the right way he's very willing to answer it Mm. in an in an open expansive way I'm finding Arsenal 
an interesting thing at this moment in time. Like, we're not the best team in the world. We know we've got a lot of issues. We've got a lot of things to sort out. But but as a sort of, I don't know, if you're looking from the outside in and, you know, Arsenal, the miniseries, uh, is, is playing out in front of your eyes, I think it's interesting. It, I think what's what's intriguing about it is normally you can you can see what's coming next. You, you know, with Unai Emery, it was pretty clear from quite early on. Right, this guy's you know he's not going to take us very he's not going to take Arsenal very far. He might he might be a sort of sticking plaster, but you, you knew the the story you were in here. Mm. It was either this is a fairly adequate manager who will get you know. Who, get Arsenal back to something average and then go on to something better. Or he was going to be a disaster. Obviously, it turned out to be the latter. But you, you just knew roughly what might happen. Whereas with Arteta, it, there just seems to be this world of possibilities that the head coach has opened up. Hmm. Coupled with an awful lot of doubts that I have. You know, some of the, these have been things that, that Sanye has inherited uh, and that the, the hierarchy have inherited. Some of it is completely outside their control. And... Um, I mean, it just it it feels like I this could go any one of a million ways, and one of them is Arsenal actually seriously re-establishing themselves as as a contender, at least for top four, maybe even better, because I think Arteta's the coach to do it. But there's, <laughs> there's so many problems, and you know, equally, I see always see a lot of people on Twitter as well saying this could just be a job that grinds Arteta down, mm. like. This is a this is a man that expects a lot from himself, and you know I know he rode back a, a, quite a bit on the the stuff he'd said after the Liverpool game. But I think what was really clear there was he, he he was kind of saying, you know, I expect a lot from myself, but look at what I've done, look at what I've done with what you've given me. Mm. I imagine what I can do if you let me have you know the squad I really want. Um, and just because we don't know if he can get that squad, we don't know what he can do with it. You know, the sky's the limit for some of these, even some of the players that are still there that, that maybe the jury's out on. I think you can see real cause for optimism. It's, yeah, you're right, it's so fascinating. And ultimately coming down, the final bit on all that is you've got a really interesting man who talks really well and gets his ideas across. And it just becomes incredibly engaging then to think about Arsenal. And you know you can have an interesting conversation yeah. with Mikel. Yeah. Look, the, the comments he made after the Liverpool game, it wasn't the first time that he talked about improving and the need to improve the squad and the quality of the squad. So they shouldn't have come as any surprise to anyone. But normally, you know, on a, in a Sky Sports interview after a game in which you've won, you know, it's kind of, yeah, we won, we'll take the positives. You know, they're, you know, they're a very good team and we're delighted to win, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the, the comments were interpreted quite widely as a challenge to the board. And, and we have to be clear and, and make it clear that today he said uh, that that's not what he meant. He said that wasn't my intention if it was misinterpreted that way. Uh, and he made the point that they work very closely together to put in place the plan to take the, the club forward. Everyone has the same ambition. But then he also sort of said... Look, if you're asking me how I can do it and what I have in order to do it, I don't know because there are a lot of questions, you know, uh, in terms of money, in terms of finances, because of everything that's going on uh, w with COVID-19 and, and everything else. But at the same time, while he's saying this and while he's saying, you know, look, we're all in this together at executive level, board level, manager, owners, all of this, we all want the same thing. We're all pulling in the same direction. He's also saying, you know, I, I'm hugely ambitious. I want to get this football club moving in only one direction and I'm going to push with everything Ooh. I have. And he said, look, we've got to work with the players that we have. And then he also said something quite interesting. He said, it's not just the players. If I can get something more out of a staff member that gives us an extra yard, I'm going to do it. So even if he has very slightly rode, rode back on the comments um, or, or tried to sort of play down the idea of challenging the board, I'm not sure the reality of that uh, is true. I think he is going to push everybody uh, to, to give the maximum, you know, from players to staff to owners to executives, you know, to, to try and get us back to where we want to be. I, I completely agree with all that. I think it was interesting when he said it was misinterpreted. It wasn't misinterpreted. You know, he said mm. that. And if you interpreted that in any way other than, you know, this is aimed at those above him, then 
you interpreted it wrong. Like, mm. there's no other real reading of that. I think the the challenge is that that then sometimes for some fans that you know that then gets framed as the idea that Sanye and Arteta or you know the Cronkies and Arteta are loggerheads. Well, like they're not. They mm. everyone I think here, you know, Sanye is. I'm told over the moon with the appointment of Arteta. I remember someone was saying to me recently that when he talks about Arteta, it's like how uh, a teenager talks about his first crush. Um, <laughs> Sanye San is delighted with Arteta. And that equally, that allows Arteta to, to speak frankly and freely because he doesn't fear for his job. He doesn't fear for the reputation. And, you know, when you when you are so respected by your colleagues, you can speak quite frankly and say, well, look, you know, this is what, this is what we all need to do. And I don't necessarily think that Sanye or Vinay or, or the Cronkies disagree with that. I do think that can pretend, you know, that's, I that's exactly the thing. I mean, how can anybody disagree with what he's saying? That's the mm. thing. I mean, if he's coming out and saying, I want 300 million pounds to spend on players because all of the ones we have are terrible, that's a ludicrous way to put it. But to say, to get this club back to where you say we want to be and for me to do the job that you've hired me to do, we've got to improve. I mean, it's it's inarguable. Exactly. It, 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 he, it, this is this. This period under Arteta, post restart, has been the ultimate advert for just give him, whether it's money, whether it's you know transfers that work, you know swap deals, just give this man what he needs mm. and trust him on that. Like you know he he's right. No one knows what's happening. You know all we know is that Arsenal have kind of drawn up some targets. They've got some ideas in mind, but you know again as he said, you can't know what what plans you're going to put into action um until much further down the line because you know if they'd qualified for the champions league i think there would have been a, a small pot of money to spend europa league i mean i don't i don't i don't know i think there's always always great talk about budgets and mm. um you know the, the the mood music out of arsenal even before covid was you know there's going to have to be a bit of selling to top up the the budget the the funds anyway but I, I don't. I don't know how this how this can happen. But I, I think you have to convince Arteta that you, you've explored every avenue, including, you know, owner funding, including mm. you know, getting access to credit to get really good players in. Uh, and I think Arteta's Arteta's earned the right to to be told we will do everything we can. We might not be able to guarantee you, you know, Thomas Partey, Apamecano, and another striker. Yeah, whatever. But we're going to try. And I think, you know, I, uh, the, the many things Sanye's got not done well, I think he does tend to make interesting deals. And I would, I would think he could be someone that might, might be able to m maneuver this strange market effectively, but mm. Arteta's entitled to see him give it a damn good go. Yeah. Um, there was an interesting question. I got to give some props to uh, to Charles Watts from Goal, who who asked Arteta. I think this is a really interesting question. You know, one of the it's been quite. Um, I found it very interesting. I know you have more experience of this than I do. You know, these these press conferences that you attend every week, and I've attended press conferences in the past. But when you're in them in a fairly regular basis, they're they're. Um, they sort of open your eyes to the the banality of a lot of the questions that are put to to managers. Um, you know, there are things that could be explored in terms of the decisions or some of the things that go on at the club um, that aren't because there are other, perhaps more peripheral things that will make bigger headlines or more interesting headlines. And I think the demands of the media world feed into that. So, you know, it's not to be completely critical of it, but as a fan, you know, there are things that I would like to know that, that quite often don't get asked. And that's no criticism of you, by the way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while since I've asked that. Yeah, yeah. But I, I thought Charles had a really good question today because he was asked, uh, he asked Mikel Arteta, 
you know, do you have a direct line to Stan and Josh? Mm. Or is it a case that there's this sort of this sort of uh, pecking order, this hierarchy, that any communication to the Cronkies has to be made via the appropriate channels? You know, do you have to go through your line manager to speak to the big boss, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, and uh, Arteta was very interesting on that. He said, uh, you know, he said, I'm surprised that you asked me that because, you know, I don't need to. I can call up Stan. I can call up Josh mm. uh, whenever I want. And I have to say that that's that's given me as a fan a little bit of reassurance in a way because uh, you know I think I think if there is only one line of communication or if communication from all parts of the club is being channeled through one one particular area before it gets to Stan and Josh maybe you don't get the the, the full weight of the message that's trying to be communicated to you if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I, I did think that was a really, really excellent um, question from Charles and, and good to see him finally asking some good ones. <laughs> I, hope, I really hope he hears that. Um, I, 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 I think what's quite interesting about this executive team that, that maybe we, we don't quite think of is that this is quite a partnership of equals. Now, obviously, you know, all in, in org chart perspectives, without wishing to go to management speak, you've got, Raul and then I at the top of the tree, but you know, for, for whatever criticisms are, are, are labelled at them, I think they are very good team workers and collegiate, and that that is kind of the the word I would sort of you know use to describe this group of. I mean, it's getting on for about a dozen when you add them all up, but the you know the the, the core of of Arsenal's management, and I think what's clear is that they they all feel like they can you know. They are a partnership rather than they all report into Raul and yeah. I, who then go and report back to to Josh. And I think you almost you, you do fit Josh into that group. And I mean, we talk about the Cronkies when really we're talking about Josh Cronkey predominantly. And he's he is you know he is someone that 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 is taking that that genuine interest. And I think you know whatever however you view their connection. He, he's making himself available, and I think that that's very encouraging um, as a as a sounding board. As I, d- I don't know exactly how how this all works out on a day to day basis, and you know how many hours he spends focusing on Arsenal. But I think it's it, what it, you're totally right that it is really powerful that the head coach has that that line to the owner, um, because. <laughs> You know, in the end, the owner's the one that that can choose to write the checks and can choose to make major, you know, strategic changes. Yeah. Because, because what's interesting is it's almost like Arteta's now not. He's almost getting more manager in the Wenger way of. It, he is the culture guy at Arsenal. He's the person that that's setting the tone for everyone else. And I, I think you know Edu is is quite similar in terms of being relatively demanding. But I think they all kind of. Arteta kind of indicated that he came in and sort of people needed a bit more of a push, a bit more demands mm. set for them. Um, and that, that does seem to have, you know, have, have had an impact beyond just, you know, beyond just the first team. And yeah. that's powerful. That, I agree with you there. That's a really good point because I think under Emery and perhaps when Wenger left, there was this sort of dilution of football operations if you like because we'd never had a head of football Wenger mm. was the head of football Wenger was the head of scouting Wenger was you know for for good for better or worse whatever you know that's who he was when it came to football matters all of a sudden we had a head of recruitment in Sven Mislintab we had the CEO in Ivan Gazidis we had what was Raul head of football operations or something before he mm. became head of football uh, or director of football or whatever it was and then Unai Emery came in and it was very very clear from the start that Unai Emery was uh, the head coach. He was Ooh. not the manager, and they were at pains to make that clear. Um, and then Sven left, and then Gazidis left, and then we had, you know, the 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 Raul and Vinay job share. So we don't have a CEO. We have the head of football, and we have the, the uh, whatever whatever he's called. Um, what what is Vinay's title? He's d- director general or whatever the. F- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's that guy. So he's the business guy, and yeah. So, but it it, it felt like. There wasn't really a leader. Who are you mm. looking for at the football club to be 
that that figurehead to be that leader that everyone looks to was it Raoul? no was it Vinay? no was it emery no so you know who is it and now it's clear who that is yeah so powerful mm. i don't know why eddie felt he couldn't do that job because I, that, that was what i thought eddie was going to be um and you know kind of one of the things we were actually told quite early after his appointment was you're never going to hear from him which it seemed quite odd and, and that's yeah. you know you might maybe you sympathize with emery a, a sort of Arsenal, you, you know, you do need that that unifying force, the the face of the brand, for want of a better term. You know, the the Jurgen Klopp, hmm. and that was not the. I don't think that was the job that that Emery was sold on. You know, we need someone to 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 be Arsenal, to represent Arsenal. And you know, he'd come from Sevilla, where he'd had Monchi and PSG. You've got you know a lot of directors that that talk to the press, and then suddenly. Uh, he comes to Arsenal and it's sort of, can you explain why Nacho Monreal's left? And he has to go, well, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can explain it, but I'm not very happy about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and things like that. And, you know, I mean, he wasn't a very good coach or manager for Arsenal. But, yeah, you just see that you see the real benefit and it comes out in press conferences because I had this the other day with um, – I was typing up, I'm sure you were in the presser, with, when Arteta was discussing Kieran Tierney. I yeah. can't remember what game it was before. And I was just transcribing what he had to say about Kieran Tierney. And I was just like, this is the nicest thing anyone's ever said about anyone. I'd run through a big <laughs> brick wall for Mikel Arteta if he would just say half the nice things he's just said about Kieran Tierney. And mm. that's that galvanises the club. That brings the best out of the players. And I think that's that's the wonder of Arteta. Mm. And I think it's, it's clear as well, that the players, most of the players anyway, are, are bought in and buying into to what he wants and what he's demanding of them. Um, I sort of said this the other day on the Arscast Extra with James, like the second half effort against Liverpool in terms of defending uh, goes back to those comments he made about like, if we suffer together, we can we can mm. achieve things. Uh, and when they did suffer, they, they got a win over Liverpool. And look, you know, that that's not a a performance that you say well look we can we can build on that there's a great way to play the game it's not and he even said afterwards that's not the game plan but it's sort of evidence that even if it wasn't the game plan even if it wasn't the way they prepared the effort can be worth it in the end and it was it was so remarkable to see an arsenal you know even in arteta's reign we've not really seen an arsenal team get played off the park and look, you know, heads are dropping. You can, you can see it. You know, the minute the mm. Mane goal went in, I think everyone thought, okay, yeah, we know what's happening here. This is another Liverpool or City score as many goals as they want, and then the game just ends. Thing. Mm. And that was, you know, there was that, and he he spoke about this today as well as after the game. There was that moment where the sort of Arsenal players collectively just kind of refused to to respond in the way they normally do. Um, again, it all comes down to, to culture, to accountability, uh, to them seeing as well the, the rewards of, of working hard, of defending well. I mean, you know, I think, you know, results like that Wolves game build towards the Liverpool game because they've almost learnt to enjoy defending. You see Lacazette back to, to a similar version of him himself at his best where he's you know chasing after every loose ball um, and when you do when you work hard Mikel Arteta does not like does not li limit his praise of you you know mm. I mean, we're going through this press conference and he's glowing about Lacazette he's glowing about even someone like Ainsley Maitland-Niles Aubameyang you know Ceballos again that that you know that's almost the reward isn't it we all in whatever jobs we work in we love hearing you know if you hear from your boss that was fantastic i'm so pleased you're going to do that again and again and again mm. um it's it, hopefully arsenal are in a, a sort of virtuous cycle with that i mean we'll see what city brings in, with that regard but mm. you can almost see that at least there's a reason to hope that it won't be just another tiresome three nil battering where you can fire your match report on half an hour yeah <laughs> yeah heady days indeed speaking of players and speaking of Ainsley Maitland-Niles first because there was a report this week from the uh, I think it's fair to say David Ornstein has uh, has an inside line or two he, he tends <laughs> to get some some interesting information and very often it's absolutely spot on and the story yeah. this week was about Ainsley Maitland-Niles 
coming to the conclusion that in order to progress in his career, he's he's going to have to leave. Um, and that probably wouldn't come as any surprise to anyone, uh, given how mm. infrequently he's played um, since Mikel Arteta took over, despite the fact he played quite well in the opening few games in which he, he featured and then didn't and has sort of edged his way back into something approaching uh, consideration, even if it's just uh, as a substitute. But, you know, it just strikes me that if this summer is going to be challenging from a recruitment point of view, and I think we all accept that it is, you know, if Arsenal can sneak into seventh and get European Europa League football, brilliant. If we can win the FA Cup and and get into the Europa League that way, even better because we will have had a a trophy and a success, uh, which would be just an amazing way to end what has been an absolute fucking lunatic season on, on all kinds of levels. Um, but he's, you know, Maitland Niles strikes me as the kind of player who would be very useful because of his versatility, because of his age, because he's, you know, made nearly 100 appearances for Arsenal at the age of, of 22. Flip side, of course, is that that could make him a valuable asset if you want to sell and, and bring some players in. But when he spoke about him today, he said he has incredible qualities, every quality that you need as a footballer to play at the highest level. He needs to do it a little bit more consistently, but he's one that can adapt to any position, which suggests that maybe he does see him as a kind of versatile player, someone who can cover gaps in the squad, um, which might be very useful if we have to have a smaller squad because of of Europe, etc. Um, so it, it doesn't sound particularly like he's a player that that he really wants to get rid of. Um, maybe the story comes more from the Maitland Niles side that, that he doesn't necessarily want to be that versatile player. Mm. He wants to be, he wants to be what he wants to be, and in order to be that, he's he's going to have to leave. Yeah, I mean, uh, looking back on that story, it does it does sound like this is more um, Maitland Niles' decision than, than Arsenal's because you know. Exactly as you said, having someone like Maitland Niles in your squad means that you've got uh, a backup right back, uh, an option in central midfield, an option at left back. You know, I mean, how many different positions has he played coming off the bench of late as well? Mm. Um, and he always kind of seems to be someone that Arteta is thinking of bringing on. Um, but I mean, you know, ultimately, the, obviously, the academy serves two purposes, and you know, he. Arteta spotlighted, you know, the the great value that comes from bringing young players from the academy right the way into your starting eleven, and how you have this, you know, end up players with this unique bond. But in the end, you can't get, you know, three or four players in every season from the academy, and so mm. some of them will kind of stall at, at where Awobi did, at where Maitland Niles did, where they're really good players, they're, and you know, huge credit to the scouts, the coaches that develop them, but. They're probably not ever going to be starters for Arsenal. Um, they could well be starters for you know an awful lot of clubs of a tier sort of slightly below where Arsenal want to be. You know, I, you look at someone like Ainsley Maitland-Niles with his pace. Also, he's got very good ball skills. He is versatile. He's quite a, a smart young lad as well. And you think he could fit in really well at a good Premier League team, even a Wolves, uh, Everton teams that are sort of hoping to to compete with Arsenal. Mm. And they would pay good money for that. I mean, obviously not as much as you'd like in a post-COVID world, but he, he nets you a lot of money and therefore is a huge success for, for the academy. I mean, I really liked Alex Iwobi, but the best thing he did in an Arsenal shirt was earn about £40 million pounds from Everton. Um, mm. I think it would, you know, he, he is someone that you probably do have to reluctantly look at selling because, you know, the players that you might be pushing to move on um, someone like Socrates, I wrote on. I, sp- I spoke to people about that last week, and, and wrote on Sunday. He doesn't really want to go. There's not really a huge amount of logic for for players like him looking at moving on because the the wage market is depressed. You know, even for even if you're going on a free transfer, you're probably better off seeing out that final year of your contract at Arsenal. Same with Mustafi. I mean, who knows whether he gets a new deal? Um, you know, if you want to improve the squad. Some players are going to have to be sold, and, and someone like Maitland Niles, Gwendouzi as well. It, it's mm. the sort of investment clubs can talk themselves into. You know, if you pay 30 million for Gwendouzi, 20 million for Maitland Niles, but that's over the cost of eight or eight or so years that you might get them. That's, that could be a bargain for the the buying club and and a good deal for Arsenal. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's clear there are some players who are easier to sell. 
than others. Mm. Simply because, I mean, the Socrates Mustafi thing always worried me, um, you know, because of a year left on their contract, because of the depressed market, because they're unlikely to get the kind of wages on offer somewhere else. Certainly Mustafi before, you know, he had this little bit of a redemption, you know, it was like, well, who is going to pay him what he's on at Arsenal? And to be fair and to give him his due, he's he's done, he's done pretty well. Um, even if I think somehow Socrates... Uh, tends to get a raw deal in comparison to the mistakes that Mustafi has made and the mistakes that David Luiz has made. I don't think he's been anywhere near uh, as error prone. Uh, you know, I don't think he's the greatest defender in the world, but certainly out of those, he's he's not been uh, anywhere near as catastrophic at times as as the other two have been. But there you go. There's you know the vagaries of football for you. And just when we talk about squad building and being creative and maybe looking to the future with some of the young talents that you have. Uh, Dinos Mavropanos, who spent last season or uh, the half of last season on loan with Nuremberg, helped them uh, stay up in in Bundesliga too. Has now got to move to the Bundesliga for next season. He is linked up again with Sven Mislintat, who is the sporting director of Stuttgart. He's going to spend the season on loan there, but Arsenal um, tied him down to a new deal before they sanctioned that loan move, which I think is quite an interesting way of doing it it's a, it's a little bit of reassurance isn't it in that if he has a really good breakthrough season at Stuttgart and develops as a as a defender and he is still only 22 years of age we have to remember that that's very young in the life of a center half you know we've got a season of football under his belt and he can come back to Arsenal and maybe become you know a cost effective part of the squad in this maybe I was going to say post covid world next year but we 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 don't know um you know, we could still be in the throes of it. Um, fingers crossed that's that's not the case. And if he doesn't do quite as well, or if he does just well enough for somebody to give us some money for him, you know, the fact that he's got a contract protects the investment. It keeps his, his va- uh, transfer value relatively high. So a, a sort of smart, interesting way to deal with a player who I think if, if they turned around and said, look, we're going to sell him, that's it, and we get four million quid for him or five million, people would have gone, okay. You know, this seems like a this seems like a uh, a more strategic way to manage his his career, if that makes sense. It's something that Chelsea have always done really, really well, and you know they end up with sort of players that are still on their books at sort of twenty seven or something. Mm-hmm. But they every year they've been you know earning Chelsea a loan fee. The loaning team's been covering their wages, and you know if they eventually have a breakout season then they could sell them on or, you know, bring them, bring them into the team. I think it's a really shrewd bit of business. Um, it's interesting to see like how once more, there's this sort of, you know, the, the Arsenal play this one quite close to their chests with, with, with loans quite a lot as well and really do um, keep a lot of clubs kind of dangling on a, a leash for um, quite a while before they pick the specific team that they go for because I know that Bremen were certain that they had him right uh, and I mean you know with Smith Rowe as well and Nketia it's interesting how just I, I mean I just find that quite odd because these things sort of suddenly come together very quickly um I think Ben Knapp is doing quite an interesting and very good job of picking and I know he's not alone in this but picking and managing the players on loan can I Rose doing well can I well. can I ask you I mean sorry just because you've raised something that I, yeah, I'm not aware of and maybe you don't know but Ben Napper is the loan manager he's in charge Ooh. of loans at the club for people who aren't aware but how um what sort of authority does he have in that regard? Obviously, everything has to be sanctioned and greenlit at, at board level. But, you know, I thought the I thought the fact that, that we've loaned Mavropanos to Sven Mislintat's club, for example, <laughs> is certainly interesting given the relationship or, or lack of relationship, you know, between Mislintat and, and Sanyehi. Yeah, that was that was surprising. I don't really think that Sanye Sanye would have had much involvement with with Mavropanos because it it's quite a fringe, uh, you know, he's quite a fringe player, not mm. one that 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 Raul would do much, I think, more than sign off on. But you know, as I understand it, I think you know na- the majority of Ben Lapper's role is, is actually re- more about managing the players that are out on loan. Um, but he is also very significantly involved in whittling down. I think it's widely known now that Arsenal 
have a final, uh, you know, candid list of candidates that they will consider loaning one of their players to. I think in this instance it was five rather than the three it's been with other clubs. But you know, the also from what I'm told, the the, the level of data. I need to try and remember um, what this was, um, what the specifics were. But they'd, he will also kind of pull together data on the loan clubs that are the the final candidates and. Mm. Put together, you know, this is why you would loan him, uh, you know, our player to X, Y, or Z team. I've just remembered now it was Eddie and Ketia, and the reason he didn't go to Bristol City twice um, was related, I believe, to their expe- expected goals and the quality of chances created. So, wow, Arsenal's fear with Nketia was that they're going to send him to Bristol City, and he's never going to really get the chances to score. Right. And that, I mean, crazy. Yeah. You know, go into it's not just sort of how many how much you're going to pay in terms of wages blah 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 it's really minute detail to pick out the right club uh, and i guess that's kind of why you would just kind of think you know if you had any doubts about doing business with sven after the the way things broke up you just maybe i don't know stuttgart well enough to know what it would be that would specifically suit mavropanos about there but it's mm. it's really just about what's the good what's a good footballing environment for them and um you know, in, in in Getty's case, it turned out that the best footballing environment for him was was playing under Mikel Arteta. But proper granular stuff, same as the case with Smith Rowe, and I, I'd see no reason why it wouldn't be with Mavropanos because he's um, kind of that that sort of level of player. Yeah, I mean, I, speaking of loan moves, you know, we we've we've not done particularly well in the loan market uh, in recent years. We think of Dennis Suarez and, and Cedric, of course, came in in January. He's a He's a permanent player now, but it was a loan move which cost us a fair amount of money. Um, and there are some suggestions, of course, that that um, Philippe Coutinho might be a candidate for Arsenal on loan. I know we kind of joked about this a couple of weeks ago, didn't we? we said, wait, wait till you see Coutinho on loan. It seems a bit more realistic now, so I have to take a serious tone um, when we talk about it's a it. Somber tone, isn't it? Somber, it's a somber, fearful tone. It, 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 look, you know, he is far from my favourite player, and I, I literally literally still cannot believe how much money Barcelona spent on him. It's, you know, whoever um, was in charge of, of that transfer is absolutely insane. Um, but, you know, when you look at the Arsenal squad right now and you look at the profile of the players that we have, um, you know, you could see how he could bring something to this team that isn't quite there or certainly isn't, isn't, uh, isn't there in terms of our willingness to use it. Um but how you know how do how do Arsenal find the balance? This is sort of what I was writing about on the the blog yeah. today. You know, how do you find the balance between players who are going to improve the squad and the need to you know rebuild and put in place a project and to to kind of get away from old habits to to get away from deals which involve players who are there to do a job in the short term, which is, you know, very much the case with the likes of David Luiz, with Socrates, with Stefan Licksteiner, you know, um, players on whom we've spent a lot of money uh, in order to get us back to where we need to get to. And instead, we've we've gone backwards. Coutinho could do something for this Arsenal team, but financially, the cost of it would surely prohibit you from doing other more inventive things. Yeah, it, it- Oh, obviously, I think, you know, the, the the big problem that Arsenal have, have had in the past is tying, you know, their managers and their squad builders over multiple years to players that aren't good enough. And, you know, I really, we go back to talking about Socrates again, I really do hold him in the highest regard. I think he's better than people give him credit for. But I also think it was quite a long contract they've given to Socrates, tying him to the club for next season as well. And... You know that that all those contracts that you build up over time massively hampers your ability to do do things. So mm. if Arsenal wanted to sign the the French player, saw that they've been linked with a, a centre back. I don't know if they do. Um, you know they've got still got seven centre backs on the books for next season. So that's you know long term money has been tied up. Coutinho, oh, it's, a, it's a tough one. It's a huge amount of money to pay for a player who's getting old and whose production is dwindling mm. kind of in the hope that he might have some sort of you know renaissance i think 
if you'd like to hope that a number 10 has a renaissance, the, the good news is you've already got one on your books. Like, <laughs> so, so we'll just try that one. Don't um, say the O word. Don't say the O word. Nearly did the whole podcast. I just, yeah, I completely agree. It, it, you, I mean, you know, I don't think they would ever look at buying him. Loaning him is not a, a it's not a, a problem with you know, vast long-term ramifications in the same way that some of the contracts they've given out are, but, mm. you know, surely there are more creative ways to spend you said on the blog it was something like 15 million am i right say it was that yeah um, that's with that, a bit of a haircut in terms of his wages and uh, the loan fee that byron paid byron paid seven and a half million pounds as a loan fee which isn't that like crazy it sounds no. a lot but it's not that i know that when we were after perisic that time there was a loan fee being touted of around six million and that's for a short-term loan you know not a season it's it's absolutely mad. I just think fifteen million in the current market could get you something more interesting uh, that could both give Arteta an immediate boost and a you know someone to work with in the long term. If you're signing Coutinho, you're only really doing it as a you know a bit of a holding pattern whilst you wait for mm. you know the other number tens wages to come off the books and and make a decision from there. It's just. <laughs> It, it just you can do interesting things in this market if you're smart and i would hope that you know this the the great scouting network arsenal still have um edu and sanye could find something a little bit more interesting to spend their money on than players who are kind of dwindling a mm. bit in terms of output and quality and are not necessarily threatening to be you know, do, does Coutinho now, does he really make a, a difference to a team pushing for Champions League football? Mm. Uh, I'm not sure he really improves this Arsenal team for certain. Mm. I, yeah, I, it just strikes me there's a, there's a discussion to be had maybe a little bit later um, down the road about recruitment and how maybe the lower leagues might yeah. be a fertile ground for a club like Arsenal in the position that it's in at this moment in time. You know, there's a lot of talent um, down the Premier League and certainly in the Championship that, you know, maybe doesn't get the chance because the pressure on clubs to do particular kinds of deals is is too high to take the risk. Whereas if Arsenal don't have a lot of money, if they've got to be creative, maybe maybe if we've got good scouts um, looking at players and young players, you know, I'm not talking about sort of journeymen, you know, 28, 29 year olds who have been doing it in the championship for a long time, but, you know, emerging talent from some of the smarter clubs uh, in the lower leagues might be a way to go, but you know, we'll save that maybe for, for another day. I just want to talk briefly um, at the end here. And finally, because we do have rather an important game to play tomorrow evening at, at Wembley. I know we beat Liverpool and I know it was really funny and I know that everyone enjoyed how funny it was. Um, how much do you think the team and the players can take from the result? I don't really think there's a huge amount beyond defensive commitment and a willingness to to really put themselves on the line that we can take from the performance itself but I, I often feel that we as fans and people who you know write about the game and analyze the game because you know we've got nothing else to do with our lives we, we look at things perhaps in a much more granular way than footballers do which isn't to say they you know they don't care about it or they don't think about it but but I think when you play a game like that and you come out and you win you you your bottom line you feel good you feel yeah. good and it is a boost ahead of a game like like city yeah i think it it just is exactly what you say it will encourage the players to believe in in the virtues of you know as we were saying of suffering together and it will just they will just they'll go onto the pitch you would hope as a united force who are going to be willing to shout at each other to talk to trap their runners um and things like that mm. no that if you can do that then city might only get one and then city you know more so than liverpool you might be able to prompt a mistake i think you know this this was a game that showed that that arsenal have the quality to to take advantage of mistakes. And I think, you know, they will know that they also then 
can put together a performance where they can just they can hold out. It also means if City do score early on, you know, their heads aren't going to drop. Their heads aren't going to go. We've yeah, yeah. In a way that it's been so long, so long since Arsenal came from behind to beat a top team. I, I can't even remember. Um, that I think you're completely right. It, they're just going to go there as a, a happy bunch of people who haven't, who aren't thinking about. Christ, we just lost to Tottenham and to Liverpool, and now we've got to play mm. City. They go, they'll be going thinking, well, we've just beaten Liverpool, and you know, according to the Premier League table, Liverpool are way better than Man City. So, yeah. what are we worried about? <laughs> How that lasts twenty minutes of Kevin De Bruyne and David Silva. <laughs> uh, at least it'll be 20 minutes. Yeah. And just very finally, are you expecting anything different from Mikel Arteta in terms of the tactics? Because he did say the other night, you know, that wasn't the game plan. I'm still not 100% sure quite what the game plan was, but I'm pretty certain it involved having a bit more of the ball than we actually <laughs> did. Um and maybe using, you know, the, the the pace of Nelson and Pepe on the wings, et cetera, et cetera. It didn't quite work out that way. There is this weird or, or interesting dynamic, isn't there, between Pep and, and Mikel Arteta, the sort of uh, master and the apprentice kind mm-hmm. of thing going on. They know each other very well. They're good friends. They re- respect each other. Um, you know, Pep will be, if not second-guessing Arteta, um, trying to figure out maybe what he's going to do, and Arteta will be the same. He, they know each other and, and th- what the thinking will be. It strikes me that, that that what City will do is probably going to be a lot less complicated because, you know, they can do one, two, three, four things very, very well. Arsenal quite uh, aren't there yet, you know? So Arteta's got to try and figure out a way to 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 deal with what City are going to uh, um, throw at us, but also to try and hurt them. I think he said today, look, they're a great team, but like every team, they have their weaknesses. If anyone knows what City's weaknesses are, it's, it's Mikel Arteta. So are you expecting maybe something a little bit different from a tactical point of view, uh, at least in terms of the, 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 the effort or the endeavor, whether we can execute it or not, is, is another question. Um, I think we'll probably get a, a pretty similar system um, obviously, a few of the, the the starters might come back in. Intrigued to see Torreira, who I thought had a really good game uh, on Wednesday night. Whether the, the the thing that interests me is, do you want some of that sort of manic energy um, as opposed to the composure of of Ceballos and and um, Xhaka? Ceballos has come on leaps and bounds defensively. The other tactical thing I'm interested in is, is Lacazette. I think we assume that it'll be Aubameyang and Pepe on the flank. So do we see Lacazette function as sort of more of a false nine? Someone that just parks himself on um, whether it's uh, presumably Rodri um, mm. or Fernandinho or whoever that deep lying midfielder is for, for City and, and tries to cut out the, the supply. I'm, I'm sure Arteta's wise enough to know that he's going to be playing this game on the counter attack. But I think it's... You know, he, he said as well that we can't spend 90 minutes parked, at, you know, no. in our own half defending the ball. So, how do you how do you keep possession? Uh, potentially, Lacazette drops deep, and maybe that's another way of, of throttling where City build their play from. Mm. Uh, I've been so impressed with Lacazette of late. Um, you know, still a long way to go before he, he's the player he was last season. But you, you're getting that in flashes. You're getting um, a player that really works out of possession. Um, and that you don't get that with Nketia. Just, I mean, he, well, he works, but he's he's not quite got the game intelligence when it comes to pressing and, and closing down. Um, I think Lacazette could be the the interesting point around which this game pivots. And I think if he has a good game, Arsenal have got a chance. Mm. Which- which is all you could really hope for against City. Yeah, well, look, you know, he's certainly made a contribution, and he, you know, he, he's he's had his critics in recent weeks, like his head, um, but he deserves credit for for his role in in the win against Liverpool. Certainly, it was it was the fact that he was on his toes, he was aware, he was sharp. You know, Liverpool could make those mistakes, and and we could fail to take advantage of them. Mm. We'll wait and see. Look, it's going to be an interesting game. Um, you know, uh, FA Cup semi-finals, cup football um, can often go the way of the underdog I think it's fair to say we're definitely the underdog going into this one but you know uh, we'll keep fingers crossed that we can come out of it the right way James as ever great to talk to you thanks a million my pleasure 
Thank you very much indeed to James. You can find him on Twitter at James Benj, at James Benj. And of course, he writes for football.london. Um, what else? What else? That's about it. It's late in the day now. It's uh, way past normal Arsecast time. But of course, we did have the Arsecast Extra yesterday. Uh, So I think I probably should, you know, stop talking and get this podcast out so people have something to listen to this evening, this afternoon, whenever it drops, wherever you are in the world. As ever, thank you very much indeed for uh, for tuning in. I was going to say you don't do that because, you know, you don't uh, tune in to podcasts. You download them, you stream them, you... Well, you could play them on TuneIn Radio, couldn't you? That's tuning in in a way, if you were to use the, the app name as a verb. I'm going to tune in Arsblog. Anyway, look, thank you for listening. We really, really do appreciate it. If you want to become an Arsblog member on Patreon, you can do that, patreon.com forward slash Arsblog. It supports everything that we do on the site, so we can keep bringing you all this uh, podcast and written and news goodness uh, that you get every single day. Don't forget, you can download the Arsblog apps for iOS and Android in the uh, Google Play Store and in the App Store as well. So you can have Arse Blog in your Arse Pocket wherever you go. Fingers crossed for tomorrow. Look, I'm not particularly hopeful, not particularly optimistic. I think they're a much better team than we are. But as uh, Wednesday showed, you just never know. Could lightning strike twice in one week? After Pep's comments about Arsene Wenger and FFP and all that kind of stuff, I kind of hope it does. Not just because I want Arsenal to win, but I would like for Pep to be a bit sad as well. Right, James and I will be here on Monday. We will discuss whatever happens at Wembley on the Arsecast Extra. Until then, have yourselves a great weekend. Take it easy. Cheers. Bye-bye. This is a message from FFP. Frequently Funny Podcasts. It has come to our attention that the end bits of this particular podcast are not that funny. Therefore, we offer a full and frank apology to Manchester City and Pep Guardiola for ever impugning their reputation by suggesting that they use the wealth of a nation-state for competitive advantage. We also sanction spending up to seven trillion gazillion million billion pounds in the next transfer window. In conclusion, to Manchester City and to Joseph Pep Pep Pepperton Pepperlong Peppity Poo Pip Pip Pop 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 Guardiola. We're so so sorry.